good, good, good afternoon, team. Uh, we have an excellent topic this afternoon. Uh, hemp, the hemp industry opportunity for extension. And in order to have a, a great conversation uh, around this topic, we have uh, individuals who are, who, 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 are, who are doing work in the area, have done work, and we want to just, want them to just share their experience with us this afternoon. We have Dr. Tom Melton, Associate Director Emeritus from North Carolina uh, State Extension. Uh, he also serves as the chair of the Industrial uh, Hemp Commission. Uh, Dr. Angela Post, uh, Extension Specialist, uh, grant, Small Grain. Uh, if he has not joined us, we will have we are, uh, Dr. Rich Bonanno, Associate Dean uh, for North Carolina State Extension will be on, on to engage in the conversation at, at that at certain, at, certain, at certain time. We have also from Virginia State University, we have Dr. M. Ray McKinney, who is the Dean and 1890 Extension Administrator. And we also, uh, we also have from Virginia State University, Dr. Wadi Mercy, who is the Associate Dean and Director of Research. And uh, Dr. Dr. McKinney is also the chair of Oz, uh, the agriculture head section for APLU. And Dr. Mercy is associate dean of, as I said, our research programs where he's, inv he's involved in hemp research as well. So we have, we have a good line, a great lineup this afternoon. And so what we would like to do now is just have Dr. Melton to uh, just share with us uh, his experience, and 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 there will be a time uh, at the end of the presentation for uh, question and answer. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we're happy to uh, share a little bit with you. I'll say that uh, most of my experience with hemp in North Carolina has been um, with the Industrial Hemp Commission and some of the work in extension and trying to keep extension and the hemp commission up with the industry they've pretty much uh been moving a lot faster than any government ag agent can uh, agency can possibly move so i'll try to highlight a few of the things we've done uh in north carolina that i think might be different than some other states and try to give you a little idea where we are and then uh, dr post will talk a little bit more about the agronomy and how they've rolled out the extension program and work with some of the agents and growers. So we're going to, since there's two of us, I'm going to move really fast. Um, so if there, if you have some questions, maybe just make a note of that and we can catch those at the end. Uh, one thing our state did that was different than most states was that they set up a industrial hemp commission. Um, and I was lucky enough to get uh, appointed to that commission and then elected chair. And I've been chair um, since the beginning. One thing that I think was unique, or I know was unique about our particular commission and the whole program was that our General Assembly would not allow the program to start until somebody, and it wasn't really said who, but somebody raised $200,000 of non-state funds to fund the commission and the staff. So they, they, uh, they put that forth and it, that did take a little while, then suddenly it happened and then the commission was formed and the commission, um, we'll go to the next slide, you can see that the commission had a wide representation of people on it, but it was very, very specified as to who or, or what was represented on that commission. Um, both of the universities had to be represented because of the pilot program. Um, then we had a, a two law enforcement officers, uh, a, a widely known sheriff, and also a widely known chief of police. And then the commissioner of ag also appointed some folks, two, two farmers, uh, one from the Piedmont, one from the coast, uh, an ag consultant, a businessman. And that time it's more textile because that's what people thought was going to happen. And then the who was the commissioner's designee, and he is one of the assist, uh, commissioners in uh, the uh, North County Department of Agriculture. So next slide. Um, our rules probably were very similar to, to most states. Uh, we had a research objective that had to be met. We were concerned about seed or transplants. We wanted certified seed. 
uh, by the traditional method of certification that is not certified by THC necessarily, but we went that route too. Uh, but there weren't any local seeds to be certified. So we had to open that up a bit and allow people to um, plant other types of seeds as well. We had a one or three year license. And of course we had fees attached to that, which now are raising enough money to actually hire some folks and, and run the program a little bit better. Next slide. As far as applications, um, ours are probably similar again to a lot of people because our hemp commission uh, had a lot of industry people on it and not regulators as such. Uh, we probably had a little bit more uh, leniency in the way we handled some things. We were very, very pro industry um, and not too many people on there were real big on regulations. So actually our rules end up, ended up being um, shorter than a lot of states applications were. So we didn't have a lot of rules out there and it served us well uh, as we got into some specific incidences that did cause some problems for NCDA because they had to uh, make some interpretations that they would have rather uh, actually seen in the rules uh, or in law. I think one thing that's really different about our program is that we've always required that anyone applying to get a, to be successful at getting an application, you have to be a bona fide farmer. And part of the reason for that, uh, we, we've told people, it was, it, this is an experiment. And if you had an experimental car out there, who do you want test driving it? Do you want someone who's never driven a car or do you want somebody who's got a driver's license and has driven a car before? So we did want to have experienced people out there testing the crop, but this has been a bone of contention for a lot of folks that just have not farmed and just want to get into the farming industry. Well, they want to get into the hemp business is what they want to get into. Um, and then of course we have them sign off on a number of things as far as responsibilities, allowing us to get into fields and, and certain people to get into fields. Next slide. Uh, what we got coming up now that a lot of people are talking about, it's a two, 2018 Farm Bill. Um, as of yesterday, we have one year to submit a plan like um, many other states would. Some states have already submitted a plan. Um, our pilot program, though, can continue on for another year, and we haven't discussed this with our lawyers yet, but for us, that is a possibility. Um, we also have a Farm Act, which is uh, just about to be passed, hopefully, don't know if it's gonna get passed or not, a lot of controversy there. A big part of that is about hemp. Um, and that does specify some things the commission can and cannot do. And we've got to, it's become a pretty political hot topic in our state legislature. And uh, we've got to try to keep those sensitivities in mind and try to match up with the federal bill as well. Next slide. So um, it is a timing issue for us because our General Assembly doesn't meet again until 2020. Um, the General Assembly, if they do pass the North Carolina Farm Act, um, our North Carolina Department of Ag develops a state plan and then once submitted to USDA, they have 60 days to approve or send it back for comments. And then the state plan needs to be in effect by October 31, 2020. Um, it's it's going to be difficult, but we're, we're, I think we can do it. Uh, really, the result of this is that potentially we could be under the pilot program for the 2020 growing season. I could readily see where the, the commission may decide to continue on a status quo or make some new permanent state rules uh, for a 2020 program as, the, uh, as we work out some things before we actually apply uh, for the federal program. But don't know we're going to do that yet, but I could see that as a possibility. Okay. So as, as a part of a summary, a hemp is legal, but there's still some restrictions. Um, growers in North Carolina, we tell them they still need to follow all the laws of the state, obviously. Right now they're following rules of a pilot program. Uh, we have a big issue right now with smokable hemp and our uh, state legislature trying to outlaw that, well, uh, likely will outlaw that. Uh, but of course they have to have a license to grow and we've had some they grow under someone else's license and that has propagated itself a fair amount but there's nothing in a rule that specifically prohibit it or allow it um, so that has not been a force very uh, very closely we are still growing for research purposes and collect some pretty basic data from growers at the end of the year 
uh, basically to justify the research purposes. Um, as far as risk management, we do tell growers that um, this is a very risky crop, um, that they should use written contracts, and we have some examples out there now. Uh, we tell everyone that they need to work with an attorney. Uh, they have to understand there's, there's, this is coming fast, and we've seen a lot of our growers get uh, really, really taken, taken out to the shed on this. They've um, lost a lot of money in some cases, and some very, very uh, uh, unscrupulous people have come into the industry. So we tell them not to invest more than they can lose, and we've had a number of growers, again, that are out there um, trying to make up for past losses, and this is probably not the crop to do it on. Next. As far as, uh, let's see, can we go, there we go. So where we are today, the hemp industry is growing quickly in North Carolina. We've got uh, over 1,600 growers now. We have more, more hemp growers than we do tobacco growers. Um, we do not allow a limit on number of acres. We don't limit the number of applicants. Um, there, there's no restriction on when an application uh, can be put in. Our biggest restriction as far as uh, limiting the number of people or acres is requiring that they be a farmer and that they cannot be a, a, a felon, convicted felon in the past 10 years. So that's kind of a quick update on that. So I'll let Angela tell you a little bit more about how it's affected the agronomics and, and working with the farmers and the agents, which is probably of more interest to you. Thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. So if you I think we're in the next slide right behind Tom. You can just continue on past that one, yeah. So, um, no, sorry, back up one. <laughs> there we go. Um, one of the main points that I wanted to make um, today in talking to Extension folks from around the country is that it really um, takes a team of people, and I think at every institution, um, it's not really being assigned. It's whoever steps up to the plate, to, at least in the other colleagues that I've talked with around the country. And we've had a number of folks step up to the plate here at NC State. Um, not only the folks that you see listed here, um, but over the last uh, few weeks, I've had conversations with folks in forestry and biomaterials and folks in textiles, looking at the post-processing side of, of industrial hemp. Um, and also we have two, um, one attorney and another um, ag economist who's working uh, heavily, trying to keep us abreast of what's happening on a daily basis at this point in in hemp. Um, so the main uh, folks here at NC State working in the agronomy are myself, um, Dr. Keith Edmiston and Dr. Janine Davis. And the additional folks you see on the slide here are working in various aspects um, of, of agronomy. Uh, next slide. And it's important to point out that it's not just the, those faces, but faces from every other aspect, um, including your Department of Agriculture, all of your staff and those things, all the things it takes to get regular research done, um, you're gonna need all of those folks in place. I've seen a couple of instances around the country where it was a one person show and it really is set up for failure if you don't have uh, expertise in many aspects because one person just can't cover all of that. Slide. So just to jump in uh, to what we've had here at NC State research wise, we uh, were fortunate that the Industrial Commission was, was formed and that the legislature and everybody was very positive from NCDA all the way to the university. Uh, there are institutions around the country who are still prohibiting their faculty from working in hemp and here in North Carolina, we were able to get permits in the first year as faculty members and that has really allowed us to hit the ground running and make sure that we stay ahead of the farmers and we're providing them information rather than the other way around. Uh, this is the second year of testing that you're seeing here uh, with nutrient variety and um, bed mulch type uh, testing. This was one of three major locations last year uh, and the image that's uh, shown here is also happens to be from our field day last year. Uh, around 125 folks, I would say no hemp event has occurred in North Carolina that didn't attract at least 100 folks. Uh, so high interest 
Obviously with tobacco losing um, ground, people are really interested in having something that they can replace that crop with. And then in 2019, so slide, Uh, this is the same uh, research location, but you can see we've expanded quite a bit, um, five to six times the amount of research at a particular location, uh, multiple PIs on the same um, space, and this is one of five locations that look very similar to this across the state uh, in this season with probably eight to ten faculty members working in different aspects. So a lot, um, a lot of things changed in a year. Um, we're all about to be applying for our, our new permits um, this upcoming year and, and we look forward to, to more work. I've got a summary in the next two slides and I'm not gonna go really in detail about all the different trials we're doing. Basically, if it's agronomy on a crop, we, we have had at least one test out on it uh, at NC State, so slide. This, this slide and the next slide are basically just some listing of the different tests that we had out in 2019. In 2018, that was a little bit less. And in 2017, we really only had uh, one test out on when, we, when we talk about uh, hemp for floral material, which is the greatest interest across the country. Um, but I'll also um, maintain that we are continuing work in fiber and seed production in our state and we've had three years of variety testing, full variety testing and population testing on those two market classes as well. Um, all of the testing you see here is on floral hemp. So it, particularly that piece of the program is a lot larger than the rest. So go to the next slide and you can browse through the remaining tests that are there. Uh, I do wanna highlight the importance of the IR4 herbicide testing uh, this year, we also have IR4 fungicide testing in North Carolina, and some additional product requests have gone in for fungicide for the 2020 season. Um, 20, this year is our second year in herbicides. 2020 will be our third year. Uh, and those are basically one of our main um, hindrances to growing a, a decent quality crop is having um, pest control that's, that's labeled. We have essentially none. Many other states have recommended lists. North Carolina has um, continued in the stance. The, the Department of Ag will not issue a recommended list. Um, and I, I, as a researcher, stand by that decision that they've made uh, because we don't have safety information out there on this crop. It, it's really one of the big hindrances we have in extension is helping agents and producers understand that just because it's safe in another crop doesn't make it okay to apply in this crop. They're saying, well, we applying in our tobacco crop, we apply in our tomato crop, what's the difference? And the difference for us here is that we're applying it to a crop that we are concentrating the outside surface of that plant and then giving it to people who are potentially immunocompromised and children and pets and things like that. So the, the pesticide testing is a key component of what we're doing and we hope it'll be a key component of what many other universities step into as they uh, travel down this, this fun, I don't know if it's a plank or a tightrope or what it, what it is, but <laughs> it's been uh, fun and sometimes scary at the same time. Slide. So I just wanted to also um, briefly cover a few common problems that we've seen um, for any folks who haven't jumped into the hemp game just yet uh, to kind of give you a flavor for what you might be dealing with. In our second and uh, huge increase year, 2018, where we went from just a few farmers permitted to um, you know, up close to a thousand by the end of that year. We had a major supply problem with uh, transplants which were root bound. Uh, even though we had growers who had their driver's license and knew what they were doing in, in creating transplants um, in that tobacco production system, they didn't really know what to do necessarily with this plant because we're taking cuttings rather than coming from seed for the most part. And it wasn't clear how long they needed to be in trays before they went out to the field. Here you can see um, a, a float tray uh, situation. The 30 day clone uh, should have, or transplant should have gone into the ground. That 45 day clone is starting to try and find its way for some root wrapping. And that 60 day clone um, is, is probably going to die after it gets about three or four feet tall. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge, it was a huge challenge for us in 2018 because you put plants in the ground that you paid three or four dollars a piece for and then uh, found that they died several weeks 
to even months after you planted them in the field. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pinpoint liability in that uh, situation. So we've done a lot of work to try and alleviate that and our suppliers for 2019 did a much better job. Uh, slide. Uh, diseases, um, we have um, here, Dr. Lindsay Thiessen, um, there's good pathologists around the country that um, are also working in diseases. These pictures actually came from University of Kentucky, uh, Nicole Gauthier. Southern blight has been an issue in almost all of the states. Uh, fusarium, not only um, stem canker, but also fusarium uh, bud rot and some other fusarium-based diseases have caused us problem. I'm only highlighting two here, uh, but it is literally a laundry list that has come into our disease and insect clinic already. Uh, for diseases. So all of the mystery about hemp not having any diseases or pests or not needing any kind of nutrition, it's, it's a plant. I think we all know in this room that that, that isn't true, but definitely an extension challenge to help. Um, in, in many cases, even though here that they have to be a bona fide farmer, we still have a lot of newer farmers or farmers who haven't really worked with a horticultural crop before like this uh, tends to be. Slide. And then uh, the pests, our biggest and most challenging pest in North Carolina has been corn earworm slash cotton bollworm, whatever you want to call it at that time of year, um, a species complex that plagues our corn and cotton and soybean crops towards the, the late summer. This is also the time frame that we have um, flowering occurring in hemp in our region. Uh, and they enjoy munching on the flowers. We don't see a lot of pest issues when uh, we're in vegetative state for the most part. You'll see some russet mites come on at that time. You may see some aphids, uh, but you generally don't see a lot of other pests until we get to that flowering time. Uh, so that, I'm sorry. You're, you're blocking my view. I'm blocking, view. looking at chats. <laughs> um, Fall armyworm, we've seen a, to a little bit um, heavier extent in 2019, but that was the first year we had seen it pretty bad. And then russet mites, uh, initially we only seen in the greenhouse, but as we moved that plant material out into the field, um, we did have some kind of natural infestations that continued late season of russet mites. Um, in field production, I still see russet mites being more of a challenge in our greenhouse systems, um, but we see them in both places. Slide. And then this one to a lesser degree, but kind of um, an interesting one for us that, you know, the genetics, I guess this was mainly put here to talk about the fact that the genetics are extremely variable. We don't really have anything, at least on the floral hemp production side, that I would be comfortable as an agronomist calling a true variety. These are strains, these are land races. Many of the materials we get into the variety testing program are essentially F1 generation. Um, all five plants in the same plot might look different from one another. Uh, so to me, that is even, even coming from a clonal situation, that, that's not a variety. Um, it's been really challenging for IOSCA and all of the certification agencies to kind of make a determination. I know they're working on that now. Um, here, these are seeded types where we have a genetic mutation that has caused a chimera. It's kind of scary for growers when they see it in the field because they think it's herbicide damage or, some, or tobacco mosaic virus, um, but we've tr tried to help them understand it's nothing wrong with the plant. It's just gonna be uh, partially uh, lacking chlorophyll. Um, and for the most part, that's the worst that it gets and they grow normally for the rest of the season. But again, just put here to talk about um, genetics and variability. I think that's close to all I have. What do I have next slide? It's just the variety test, yeah. So I wanted to um, show the main variety test we had in 2018. There were 12 varieties tested across the state total. Nine of them were in multiple locations. So here is the multi-location um, table showing our um, dry matter and our dry weight per plant uh, yields. I did not order them like we would normally see in, in yield tables where you yield put them in order from top to bottom um, because I wasn't comfortable saying that this one would always outperform that one. So we put them in alphabetical order here instead. Um, this, this year, uh, we'll be more confident to order those by yield values because we are already seeing that data come in and things like Bayox, Endurance, and Stout where you see high yields here. 
were also our higher yielding varieties or strains this year. Uh, THC compliance was good last year. We did have two varieties, cherry by cherry and cherry wine, which by our state standards would have um, been in compliance. I put a star beside them because there were individual plots. I tested plot by plot by plot. There were individual plots in those varieties where if it had been a whole field, um, our NCDA would have come out and destroyed that material. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, continuing with the USDA regulation that we will be looking at a design uh, determined by GC, which would include uh, the, the decarboxylated um, THCA. So we're going to be looking at total THC moving forward. That won't change anything for us here in North Carolina because we've always been looking at it that way. Uh, but there are many states uh, that will be affected by that because their materials uh, will likely be over that THC value. CBD levels ranged in 2018 from three to 9%, a little bit on the low side for what we're looking for, uh, but we were in an early harvest situation because of hurricanes. And that's all I have that I'll be on for the rest of the call to answer questions. You want to answer that uh, springtail oh, question? question? There was a springtail question up there, maybe. I didn't see it. Can um, you scroll? Minnesota, I think. We're looking for this question. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Let's entertain one question while we are getting ready for uh, our colleagues uh, from Virginia State. Do we have a burning question? Uh, I have one uh, seed, seed, seed production. Where, where, where are we across the country with, uh, let's say, seed, seed production? So the, in, in our state, um, I, I'm fairly sure that I'm one of the only permit holders who identified seed as my market class in mm -hmm. North Carolina. Um, but we have tested um, as many as 15 varieties, and just depending on the year, um, sourced from six to seven different countries, also depending on the year. So we've mm -hmm. tested materials from Canada, France, Italy, the Czech Republic, Hungary, um, getting good yields, uh, I would say, Weed control is going to be the biggest issue in that system because the seeding rate is not really high enough to give us a fast closed canopy like fiber. Um, so I would say weed control is going to be one of our main issues. Uh, we do have a couple of processors coming online supposedly in the 2020 season to accept seed produced in the US, um, but initially they will be sourcing their seed from Canada and bringing it in by the truckload to process here. Mm. Uh, so look for that um, to grow, but I don't know how quickly on that side with the CBD bubble facing us. Thank you, Dr. Post. I have a question. This is Roy. Hey, Dr. Love you. This is Roy Bullock, Tennessee State. You hearing me okay? Uh, I, can't, I can't hear you. Is someone speaking? Uh, uh, let's move into the discussion of uh, industrial hemp at Virginia State University. Uh, Dr. Ray McKinney and Dr. Mercy. All right, colleagues, can you hear me? I can hear you on this end. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> say good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity participate in this call on a topic that seems to just have uh, tremendous interest regardless of the state you're located. <clears throat> uh, I just want to echo some of the things that Tom Milton has said from a standpoint of there's tremendous interest in this crop uh, in Virginia. We have a number of people who have come out to inquire about it. Uh, but in Virginia, Virginia still continues to kind of hold the law on this and has not released it into mass production. We know now that we're moving in that direction. People are applying through the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to acquire permits. Uh, they're getting permitted there and then engaging in production. The one thing that seems to have gotten us really in Virginia on this track has been 
to some interest in the in the plant from a fiber standpoint, but it seems that the cannabinoid oils have just taken interest in that is taken off exponentially to the point where the state of Virginia, through the uh, governor's office, has approved the manufacturer of uh, CBD oils. But the thing about it is they have to apply for a permit and then they are governed by the regulations of the state. And they are under the regulations from a standpoint that you have to submit your location, all the identification information, as well as be pre-inspected uh, and allowed to go into production, but then you have to be uh, subject to on-site, on-spot uh, inspection to continue being able to produce. We here at Virginia State are one of uh, three institutions that have been approved to do work with the industrial hemp in Virginia, that being us, uh, Virginia Tech, and uh, at uh, uh, James Madison are involved in it as well. So here at Virginia State, uh, it is under the auspices of our agricultural research program. And so at this point, I'm gonna just turn the mic, let Dr. Mercy take over. I probably said more than I know. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKinney. Uh, I'm Wendy Mercy, I'm the research director here. Now, I'm gonna pass, uh, just skip uh, the first few slides because they are, I didn't know the audience, so this audience is very familiar and I don't need to show that. So please uh, go to the next. Yeah, I, I, again, this is the general information about industrial hemp, and I think everybody's familiar with it. The next, please. The next. Then the next one. Yeah, I think like any other place, the, uh, the 2014 Farm Bill legal, legalized growing industrial hemp for research, and uh, Virginia, the governor, signed the bill on July 1st, 2015. And next, and that permitted, <coughs> as Dr. McKinney said, uh, three universities entered the MOU with the Department of Agriculture uh, to grow industrial hemp uh, for research and later on the University of Virginia joined that. Uh, next. Yeah, and then uh, after the 2018 Farm Bill, <coughs> uh, the Virginia General Assembly came back and revised some of the rules. And basically what it did was it eliminated the need uh, for hemp research program in, in order to have uh, hemp. And the farmers are not, no longer required to go through the universities uh, to grow industrial hemp. They can directly register with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and get their own seats. And also the law allowed uh, VDAX to conduct random TH testing. And there are also other rules, but uh, these are the main rules which are passed and signed on March 21st. The next one, please. Next slide. Yeah, actually the bill was signed here at Virginia State University Farm. Uh, the governor came here and you see Dr. McKinney, our provost and other officials. <coughs> so okay, just to briefly, our research to focus on the three areas. First of all, just finding those adapted varieties uh, which come from Europe and Canada for this part of the country. Then also uh, determining optimum planting dates and of course uh, determining nutrient requirements. Those, these are the three uh, major uh, research areas here at VSU. Next slide, please. And uh, this is just to show you one thing we found out very early on, as mentioned earlier, is the wheat problem, uh, especially if the 
hemp seedlings are not establishing quickly. They can be taken over by weeds and we don't have any registered herbicides to, to control them. So that's the first uh, issue we dealt with. Next slide, please. And these are <coughs> some of the varieties, as you see, the, uh, the grain type can grow up to four to five feet, while the uh, fiber type uh, grows uh, up to seven feet. And next slide, please. And some of the results just uh, we, <coughs> we got at our research at the farm is that mid-April is too early for this part of the country, it kind of tends to be cold and uh, emergency is very slow. And the mid-June planting date can be a little bit late uh, because the, the plants just, <laughs> when they are about one feet high, they start to flower. Uh, and also that if they set seed, they tend shatter. So the early uh, late May is a good planting period, especially if there is sufficient rain. Uh, the next slide, please. And the other is we found out is that uh, industrial hemp is a very heavy nitrogen feeder and uh, it requires a lot of nitrogen in comparison to other crops. Next slide. And we conduct uh, we conduct three field days. Uh, it's very popular. Uh, the first year we had about 140 participants because the room was not big enough to hold people more than that. Then the next year, so we changed the avenue last year and uh, we had about 475 uh, participants from all over the state and some from a neighboring state. And we have uh, industrial hemp advisory uh, committee and uh, farmers and processors which work with our researchers here at Virginia State University. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to show some slides uh, about our field day. It is the uh, farmers uh, and uh, presenters from the three universities, primary James Madison, Virginia Tech, BSU, and lately from uh, UVA. Uh, that's the most popular part of the round table discussion. Next slide, please. Also, it attracts a lot of uh, uh, members of the General Assembly. Uh, that's one day a lot of them come here and interact with our farmers. So the field days have been a successful. Day. The next slide, please. I think I just put in here from what we heard from the growers and what our researchers uh, are telling us that the first challenge will be getting varieties uh, suitable for this part of the country. As I mentioned earlier, weeds are going to be a major problem. Also, pests, the same pests mentioned earlier uh, are also a problem here. And if the planting is late, we encounter seed loss and also uh, water logging. And I think in many areas, the, there should be some bed or some kind of uh, <coughs> measure to counteract water logging. Of course, we still have to do more research on the fertilizer rates, uh, planting rates, and uh, harvesting rates. And next slide. And from the general uh, production, the challenge is, of course, is the, the market. They, they, a lot of people are growing it without <coughs> to sell it and to whom to sell it. And uh, as of now, we don't have uh, processing of our plants here, to my knowledge, here in Virginia. So that's 
major issue. And the seeds are still relatively expensive because they are coming from Europe and from Canada. And I don't know how long that can be sustainable. Of course, th these are some of the issues that we are <coughs> farmers and others raised during our field days. Uh, the crop insurance, I think it's addressed by the 2018 farm bill in, in the rulemaking. And banking guidance, but still a lot of bankers are uh, a little bit reluctant to process money from industrial hemp because of its association with marijuana. And of course, clear guidance from FDA for the CBDs. And even interstate transportation has been um, an issue, but I think that's going to be addressed by the farm bill. Uh, <clears throat> up to now, uh, to July 19, 2019, there are about 897 industrial hemp growers registered with VDAC and 174 processors and uh, 45 industrial hemp dealers. And uh, according to uh, uh, VDAC, about 10,000 acres is planned. Uh, at least they have given license for, for that much planting in Virginia. I think that's all I have, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any question you may have. Okay. Do we have any question in the chat? What happened to the plus? I ran off far. Look at that. So Dr. Lattimore, I, this is Sandy, and I'm just letting you know that I'm tracking all the questions that are coming through the chat. Yes. And um, these will be, the, there have been some answers, okay. but the most recent one is, is anyone looking at old heirloom hemp from the old Catholic missions that were grown from, for rope production from late 1800s to early 1900s? Uh, Dr. Bonanno has given a response to that question um, that most of those genetics were destroyed um, after the Marijuana Tax Act. But others might have a response to that one. And for anyone who has joined this call strictly by telephone, um, while we're in the Q&A, you can unmute yourself using the star six. Okay, this is Roy. I'm going to make an attempt again. Can you hear me? Maybe I'm not doing something right. We can hear you, Roy. We oh, can you can. You. Good, good, good. Hello, everybody. One of the things we have here in Tennessee is the Crop Improvement Association that we send our corn seeds and soybean seeds and so forth through. There's nothing for hemp. Does anyone, any state have any intent? I'm having some conversation and trying to see if we can get hemp seeds involved in the Crop Improvement Association here. I think it's important. Um, and I agree with a lot of the other questions that folks have, but uh, I think we need to look at getting those seeds into the association so that there could be some verification of quality. Does any state uh, have intent in adding hemp to that association if you do have that association? In North Carolina, we have a crop improvement association. Um, it's led or directed by Dr. Bill Foote, who also happens to serve on the board of IOSCA right now. Um, he's been getting heavy pressure both in our state and nationally to start developing a set of rules for certification, not only in our state, but also nationally. Um, he has been out to visit some of our research and also some farmer fields to kind of assess the genetic variability that's going on. Um, seed production wise on the seeded and fiber types, we're a little bit closer as far as variability goes in getting that to a place where it would be acceptable <coughs> seed laws to be certified. Um, obviously it can be certified clean and certified for germ, but as far as um, genetic variation, we're having more issue there. On the clonal or transplants from uh, feminized seed, we are years away, I'm afraid, for that. Um, 
because it's going to be more in a situation like sweet potato or strawberry where we need to start uh, from tissue culture at some point with a certain number of plants rather than starting with these mothers started from seed or started from a previous mother. Uh, we're just seeing too much variability there, but no word yet on when that will happen. Thank you. Um, this is Desmond Mortley at Tuskegee University. Um, I'd like to ask the presenter from uh, North Carolina. Um, I see she has one of the varieties that I looked at this year, at least the only one I had, and that was cherry wine. And uh, I wanted to find out whether you have established any appropriate sampling date. For the buds. Are you? Are, did you ask appropriate sampling dates? Yes. Right, because I take notice, which I observe that with us too, that um, your THC level <laughs> tend to be a little high, and ours was high this year to when we sampled. Sure. So cherry wine. Um, you said you were. Did you say you were in Tennessee? <laughs> no, I'm in Tuskegee, Alabama. Sorry, Tuskegee, Alabama. Alabama. Okay. Yes. So in, in our area, in our latitude here, cherry wine is one of our earliest flowering varieties. It's a short season. Um, it mm -hmm. may have an auto flower situation going on rather than a, a strictly photo period sensitivity. Um, right. So in my case, that year's test was harvested early and those were the only, those two early flowering types were the only ones that got high on THC. And so I think we were actually a tad bit on the late side harvesting those. Um, in 2018, we were just getting our mind around even how to time uh, testing and how to time harvest, making sure you're paying attention for the color change in those trichomes is the best right. way. Um, yeah. And once you get to week four and five in cherry wine and many of those other varieties that have cherry in the name, you should yeah. start considering pulling some of those um, because they have been earlier in starting to increase that THC level. We did have lots of successful growers in 2018 and 2019 who had the same variety from the same supplier uh, and did not go hot, but it's not 100% genetics that caused that problem. I think a lot of it was timing for us. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, for, for North Carolina and Virginia, this is Mark again. Uh, my question is around drying. Uh, first of all, from from your research perspective, uh, what are some of the challenges? Uh, are you experiencing challenges with with drying, with drying, and also uh, as far as the producers, uh, how what how are they drying the uh, the plant? So our producers are here in North Carolina are drying in every available space uh, from converted warehouses to converted poultry houses. Mm -hmm. uh, gro growers drying in greenhouses and peanut trailers and sweet potato curing barns, kind of anything, they, just like the equipment, they're using what they have on hand. <laughs> um, for tobacco growers, they are drying in traditional and uh, either old, old style bulk mm -hmm. barns, like burly tobacco barns and also modern barns. Personally, in my program, I have dried in box barns, bulk barns, and poultry houses, and we've been successful in all three of those cases as long as you keep a low level of heat on it and some air moving. Um, in those closed up spaces like Connex boxes and warehouses, the need for dehumidification comes in and a lot of people are buying industrial dehumidifiers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's it. In Virginia, we, we don't have that many growers, so we need more uh, fiber. But as I said earlier, uh, they use all kinds of places to, to dry it, uh, especially south side, different mm -hmm. old tobacco farms. In our research area, uh, we, we used uh, some open. Uh, Greenhouses, which are not used for other purposes, with a little bit of heat for the materials we harvest from the farm. So yeah, drying is going to be uh, an issue down the road. Okay, okay thank you. 
Another question here from Tuskegee, if you guys don't mind. Cause, Go ahead. Um, uh, again, to, for, to my NC State colleague, uh, one of the things I observed in the field this year, uh, of course, I never planted until about the 4th of June, and they, they practically went into flowering right away. So uh, my plants were not more than about two feet tall all the way through. Uh, but one thing I observed and um, is that after a while, I'd say maybe 75 or so days, that my plants began to dry up as if they were senescing. Have, have you observed anything like that in your work? So sometime in early August, is that what you're indicating? Yes, yes. So that for us, that would be a little bit on the early side. Are you talking about seeded types, fiber types, or no? CD? No, no. This was the the same cherry wine with okay. for the femin. I use feminized. Um, I mean, clones from feminized uh, seed. <coughs> so for if it was cherry wine, uh, that would not be surprising to me. As soon as we get into that second week of flower, um, you're going to start seeing the inner oldest leaves turn bright right. and drop and then the exactly next, next oldest and the next oldest that is completely normal and because okay. cherry is an early maturing variety i would expect it at that time okay okay all right yeah. thanks here in virginia for us the june planting didn't work because the plants start to flower just with that just two feet high and that the may is uh, good for us around here. And of course, it depends on the variety. We didn't have a, a cherry wine uh, in our test, but uh, for most of the varieties we tasted, uh, early, mid May is good. Okay. Uh, Dr. Post, I noticed that on your field trials, uh, trials you, uh, you, 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 you use plastic. Any, any conversation along those lines? Yes. So the first data um, that has been analyzed has just come back in the last 10 days or so. I've presented it a couple of times already. Uh, zero significant difference for yields for six different varieties, mm -hmm. plastic versus um, open beds. Mm -hmm. I don't have the uh, CBD levels back yet or THC to see if there were any differences in that, but height, width, stem diameter, 50% uh, flowering date and yield did not differ between the two types of bedding. So we're continuing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for, for, uh, I'm thinking for, 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 for I, I noticed Tennessee, uh, Virginia, as well as North Carolina. Uh, my question is along the line of processes. Uh, do you have, uh, and and what I, my question is this is, is stem from this one. We getting a lot of calls in Georgia of individuals I want to put in. I want to grow a thousand acres. I want to grow five hundred acres of a uh, hemp. And in talking with uh, a processor uh, just recently, as last week, uh, are is that realistic to think along those lines as in terms of acreage at this stage in the game? We, you know, um, in Tennessee here, we have a serious problem finding processes. Okay. That's a big problem. As a matter of fact, I had a big discussion this morning, and um, <clears throat> a lot of people have grown up to a thousand acres and are having problem getting them processed because the processing equipments and so forth are awfully expensive. Um, extraction of the oil, especially. You're looking at about five hundred thousand dollars for a good unit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is something that I think we all need to consider. The the small growers are running into most of the problems, and that's what I'm concerned with. That they may be using materials that not uh, safe, mm -hmm. okay. just to get rid of the the plant and probably make some money out of it, and could end up being a health problem. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, Mark, I have had an old adage my whole career, 
relative to new enterprises and things. And I've always said, you should grow in the business, not necessarily go into the business. <laughs> I think we're at a state where people need to slow down a little bit and get their feet under them, uh, pay a little attention to the data that's now being generated. It's coming out of North Carolina State, uh, Virginia, various locations, and kind of get uh, a handle on how to produce, how to grow this, do I have a market? How am I going to process it? Once you kind of get a handle and a grasp and understand those things, then you can sort of sort, sort, sort out your acreage. How big do I really want to be? Any any other comments from anyone on the on on on, on the line? I got some. How do you just talk into this thing or? Yeah, you, yeah, we hear you. We hear you. So my name is Drew Landry. I'm from Blackfeet Community College, and uh, tribal colleges. We are interested in um, in processing and being on the front end of this thing. Um, we have some producers, and they go through the state permitting process right now. The tribe is working on our own body of laws, but you know, as colleges, we want to be in a position where we can do the testing and we can process hemp that's grown on our reservation. And I think that research should, should go toward developing those processes. Um, there's a lot we don't understand and we don't know about hemp because it's so early. Mm -hmm. Even from just, you know, wanting to not cross pollinate, not having different varieties next to them. But where we really want to be is to be able to process it and, and, and be recognized as sovereign nations, I guess. Okay. Okay. I think uh, from I'm, I'm speaking from, from 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 my experience in Georgia, uh, we are we are basically at the early stages in Georgia as it relates to uh, really everything, seed production, the the, the pro processing processing facilities. But what I understand now, we have potentially two processing facilities that are. Really, in the process of it, of, it, of it coming up and run, coming up and running, so we don't we don't have we don't have any that's online right now. Uh, well, we can just set fully online and have been processing acres and acres. So we uh, we're on the same page there. And because you know, interstate commerce is still not clear about this, and there's some pitfalls there. Correct. That's correct. Right. Okay. You know, we we host, hosted the um, Industrial Hemp Association as a state once every month. We get anywhere from 250 to 300 folks attending. And as you speak with them, you could get different answers from just about everybody. You talk to them this, about the same question. One lady says to me, says, I talk to them, I have different answers. Um, so we got a far way to go, folks, a very far way to go. Cedric okay. Ogden, Fort Valley State. Um, I was uh, I was wondering if there is uh, if have we moved to the um, stage where we're using uh, technology to monitor some of the fields as far as uh, determining if we have uh, male plants in the vicinity of female plants that type of thing. Have we gotten to that stage yet in some of uh, the research in North Carolina or Virginia, Virginia State? Is there anything as far as technology and monitoring, say like drone technology currently right now? Or have we not gotten there? Sorry, in monitoring what you said specifically? Things such as uh, uh, determining weed problems, things like like using a uh, remote sensing to test like NDVI, uh, normalized okay. difference vegetation index to see if they're, to just, to, just to check the crop health that type of yes. thing, is there any current research going on in your areas for that now? So we, um, we have a partnership with Precision Hawk here in North Carolina, um, mm -hmm. necessarily specific to hemp, but we are using um, one of their pro, uh, project profiles to count our hemp plants to take um, whole plant areas of that and any mm -hmm. other items um, we have not really since there's so much low-hanging fruit in this crop, we haven't 
gotten to deep dive on that yet. I'm sure it's coming just like it is in every crop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good. All right. uh, we, I, we haven't done the, that kind of work. We had some interest uh, on our field day from uh, companies who are dealing with drones. But the issue mm -hmm. of uh, the females, uh, female and male plants from some of these varieties is an issue. Uh, because even the varieties we are supposed to be uniform are not like that. And that, right. that can create a problem. Right. Okay. Uh, un unfortunately, we've got, we're going to have to we're going to have to bring this discussion, the conversation, to an end. Uh, remember the names of the individuals, as well as the faces of the individuals from the different states that was on. And if, if you was on the Zoom, we have Dr. Tom. We had Dr. Tom Melton uh, from North Carolina. From North Carolina, we had Dr. Angela Post from North Carolina. We had Dr. Ray McKinney, uh, Virginia State University. Dr. Uh, Woody Mercy, from also from Virginia State University. Uh, and before we leave, we would like to state, thank Mark Sumner and Terrence Woolfolk uh, for our technical assistance. Uh, definitely Sandy, Sandy Rubel for providing assistance and really just guiding and make this, making this uh, webinar uh, happen. And also we want to thank Ed Jones for the work that he, uh, he, he, was, he did and also and making this uh, this work this uh, webinar successful as well. So once again, I want to thank you for your participation. Thank you for your input, and have a good weekend.